I remember when I was uh, like five or six years old, I told my adopted parents, I told them that, you know, I don't need any friends and I'm not gonna make any friends because I, you know, I didn't want to get hurt. Hi, I'm Jen Lindsay. I've been serving for Royal Family Kids Camp for 20 years. Royal Family Kids is a camp for kids in foster care, usually in at-risk homes. A lot of kids in the foster care system have trust issues, have issues um, bonding with other people. A lot of that has to do with moving from home to home. It has to do with abuse that they've experienced. My parents weren't able to take care of me around the age of three, three and a half. I got sent out to the foster care system and I went through you know, a series of four or five different families before I found the family I'm with now. So I was in the foster care system from the ages of three to eight, and I was a part of Royal Family Kids Camp from, you know, the earliest you can go, five years old till all the way throughout high school. Something I really enjoyed about the camp was the relationships you build with the counselors. Um, you know, you have all these fun activities. You go to the lake, uh, go fishing, go canoeing, spend, spend a day at the beach, whatever it is. But um, all that stuff was fun, but the most impactful part for me was definitely the relationship I ended up having with some of these counselors. And like, I felt like I was a valuable person. I felt like I was loved by these people. And I just felt like they were just my family and they were my friends. I could tell that these people were people that I trusted. And I could tell that they were people that cared for me. After I wasn't able to come to the camps anymore, I was like, well, I need to go as a counselor just you know, to make the same impact to these kids that the counselors then made on me. A lot of our counselors that were campers, that's one of the reasons they come back. They're like, camp was my consistent place in my life. No matter what happened in my life, I knew that I had camp. And now that I'm an adult, I want to do the same for someone else. I want to show them that no matter what happens in their lives, that there's camp. You know, I'm just trying to be, be a light to them and I'm trying to like show them the true hope um, through the gospel. Every camp of Royal Family, we do something called I Saw God. So at the end of camp, we say, who saw God today? And we go around and kids share stories of the day and how they saw God. So it's kind of a twofold to show them that God has been in every single aspect of camp and in their lives. A time to reflect on what they've been doing at camp and just a way to show all the goodness that God has in their lives. I think sometimes, especially for these kids, they have a hard time seeing the good. That's why we send home the photo album so that when they are at home and they're in, going through rough times, they can remember the positive memories that we provided for them, but also know that camp is coming again. What a perfect picture of what it looks like to experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact. I, Royal Family Kids Camp has been going on here at Chapel Street for 20 years because of your partnership. And I want you to hold on to that word partnership. It'll come up here shortly. But because of the generosity, both financially and contributions from people who have served countless of hours and years investing in Royal Family Kids Camp, we're celebrating 20 years. And so hopefully as you walked in, you saw the purple balloons and the kiosk in the lobby. There's people wearing purple shirts and they would love to share a a little bit more about their camp experience with you and invite you to think about a way that you may be able to contribute. Maybe it is. Maybe you're available to go for a week of camp. Maybe you're able to do a load of laundry. There's everything in between. And so we would really encourage you and invite you to consider a way that you may be able to partner with Royal Family Kids Camp this year. And so I really thank you for that opportunity. And I, I think it's such a beautiful picture of the body of Christ. Again, there's so many ways that you can serve and contribute at Royal Family. This morning, we'll continue in our sermon series called Praying with Paul, and John Dixon will be here with us bringing the word, but let's stand as I read the scripture this morning. It comes from Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. 
Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus in Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus, and this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. You may be seated. Good morning. Good day. Well played. (laughs) Um, This has become my happy place, really. Uh, I don't just mean this pulpit here, though I do rather like that. Uh, I mean uh, coming to church. Uh, This has been such a joy for uh, my family to start attending here, and that's down to you. Uh, So thank you for making us feel uh, so welcomed. Yet, it is a time in America where the Christian community is feeling a lot of pressure. You may have picked that up. In fact, there's some data that suggests there's a little bit of pressure on the Christian community. Um, Church membership in America has dropped dramatically in the last 20 years. Something very weird has happened. Gallup poll released recently a study that showed that in the 60 years between 1940 and 2000, there was only a 3% drop, hardly statistically significant. But look, since 2000, a 23% drop. This is dramatic, and I am getting the vibe that a lot of American Christians are feeling the pressure. Now, part of the pressure comes from uh, a kind of pivot in our culture where a lot of people are suspicious of the church, actually feel the church has done more harm than good. And again, we have some embarrassing data. Ipsos poll found that four out of 10 Americans agree with the statement, religion does more harm in the world than good. Now don't think, oh, they must be thinking about Hinduism or Islam or something like that. No, 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 they're thinking of the main religion in America, four in 10. And if that's depressing, spare a thought for my country, six in 10 agree religion does more harm than good. But here's the thing. Jesus said, the world would know us by our, do you remember what he said? Love. And yet somehow that memo (laughs) isn't getting out. And in this context where we're feeling a bit of pressure, Um, it's possible for some of us who are believers to almost give up on our mission to bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the world and lose faith in the Christian community itself. Not to say you're abandoning church, like you might be here today, you know, faithfully. You were here last week and the week before, but just... You're not feeling it. You've lost a bit of confidence in our gospel mission and in the power of Christian community. Well, our text today speaks wisdom to both issues, brings focus, gets us back on target with the gospel mission and with loving community. 
This talk is the final in the little series you've been doing through praying with Paul. Most of Paul's letters begin with a thanksgiving and or a prayer he prays for the people he writes to. And so we've been studying these and we come to Philippians chapter one. But this is also the first of a new series, just a little three-week series where I get to take you through the letter of Philippians, at least as far as I can in three weeks uh, up to the end of chapter two. So um, we're going to dive into the letter. And before we look closely at the thanksgiving that Paul offers at the front of Philippians, and then the prayer he offers for the Philippians, I want to do a little bit of historical background. Anyone object to historical background? I promise you, in small doses, history never hurt anyone. And I just want to say three, uh, I think, important things, but very short things by way of historical background. Something about the city of Philippi, because, you know, we've been digging there a long while, we know quite a lot about it. Uh, something about the pressure Paul and the Philippians were feeling when this letter was written. And then something about the beautiful partnership between the Apostle Paul and the Philippians, which had been going on for a decade. Firstly, the city of Philippi, um, all I want to say and there's much we could say, is that uh, Philippi was a relatively small city, but really significant. Um, kind of like Geneva, you know? Um, let see. Uh, so uh, we know from the archaeology, there were about 15 to 20,000 people in Philippi at this time. Uh, there's about 20,000 people in Geneva. Um, so not, not super large, but super significant. And, and part of the reason it's significant, they sat on the super highway of antiquity. This is the Via Ignatia. It's, it's a highway that went right across what we now call mm, Greece, uh, across to Turkey. And it basically connected uh, this region to the western part of the empire and to the eastern part of the empire. And if you were a city, and they were the most prominent city on the Via Ignatia, you knew everything. Everything went past you from the east to the west. So they felt pretty important. The other thing to know about uh, Philippi is that Emperor Augustus, the first of the emperors, elevated Philippi to what's called a Roman colony. Now that may not sound like a very cool thing to be, but it made Philippi a tiny Rome with very cool tax breaks and free land for retiring soldiers. So people there were very loyal to the Roman Empire. Now it's important to know that as we also think about the pressure that Paul and the Philippians were feeling at the time of this letter from the Roman Empire. We know Paul is in prison. We'll get to this next week. But Paul says in this letter, in the uh, lines immediately before, um, immediately after what we're looking at today, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, he means he's locked up in a jail in Rome, has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the entire palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. So Paul's not having a super happy time. He's been preaching that message of Christ and now he's locked up in Rome. Pressure. But here's the thing. At the end of chapter one, Paul reveals that the Philippians themselves are also feeling the same pressure. It's been granted to you, Paul says, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. There he's referring to the fact that when he was in Philippi 10 years earlier and preaching to them, he got locked up in a prison in Philippi. We think we know the prison, actually. We think there's archaeological remains there. Now he's in Rome, locked up in prison. But his point is, you Philippians, you're going through the same thing. And my point is, this church was feeling pressure. The pressure to give up on that gospel mission. The pressure to lose faith in Christian community. And this wonderful letter is designed to refocus us. Um, the uh, final piece of historical information that's worth knowing 
is that there was a beautiful partnership between Paul and the Philippians for 10 years before this. And what, what I mean by partnership is the, the Philippian church had been financially contributing to Paul and his big team ever since Paul had been there 10 years before he wrote this letter. And in fact, the immediate um, uh, reason for writing this letter is that Paul in prison in Rome has just received a great big parcel of goodies from the Philippians via one of their leaders named Epaphroditus. And the reason we know this is because Paul says it. I'm not just making this up, right? It's not secret historical knowledge. He says it at the end of the letter. It was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, 10 years earlier, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was down the road in Thessalonica, you, up in Philippi, sent me aid more than once when I was in need. And not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Imagine that day in about the year 62, when Paul in prison hears a knock on the cell door and a voice that he remembers from Philippi. Epaphroditus, having made the 14-day journey from Philippi to Rome. Just take that in for a second, 14 days. Americans complain about how far Sydney is. Rubbish. It's just one day of your life. 14-day journey in antiquity from Philippi to Rome. And there's Epaphroditus with a great big parcel of gifts for Paul. Imagine how Paul felt. Well, we don't have to imagine because the opening of the letter is bursting with joy because of all of this. So let's pivot now to the thanksgiving we see in that opening paragraph. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all of God's holy people in Christ Jesus in Philippi together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love these words. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because such joy. Now, before we look at the because, before we look exactly at what he thanks God for, I just want you to notice a couple of little tidbits in the opening lines that are worth knowing. You notice Paul says this letter is also from Timothy, one of his key team members. We never refer to this as Timothy's letter to Philippi, do we? We don't even say Paul's and Timothy's letter to Philippi. We, we just say Paul's letter to Philippi. But Paul has included Timothy. Timothy was actually involved in the writing of this letter. No doubt, as Paul's composing the letter, he lets Timothy have a little line or two. How do you think I should say this, Timothy? And the reason I'm pointing this out is that Paul was the master of building a team. And I won't bore you with the details, but there's a lot of nerdy scholarship about the circle of Paul. It's what they call it, right? The, the ministry team of Paul. And we know 50 names of, of people in the great big team of Paul running around the world, bringing the gospel to people. And I say that because... As we, as a church, very much rely on the staff team at the moment. Let's give thanks that Pastor Jeff has over the years built up such a brilliant staff team. Let's rely on that staff team. Let's pray for that staff team, yeah? Because team ministry matters. The other tidbit that's worth knowing is that this, alone of all, all of Paul's letters, is written not just to church members, but to the leaders of the church. He says, this letter is to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, that's, you know, the average Christian, together with the overseers and deacons. Together with the overseers, this is classic Pauline language, bishops and ministers is what it says, the leaders of the, of the church. 
Now, we have letters of Paul that, that are mainly the letters of Paul are to congregations. And then we have three letters, maybe a fourth, that are uh, as to a leader of the church, okay? But this is the only letter that is to both. God's people and, and the leaders of God's people are meant to listen to this letter. The Lord wants us all to learn it. Whether we're new church members like me, long-term church members, whether we're staff team, church council, Sunday school leaders, Bible study leaders. This is for all of us, Philippians, all of us at the same time. And it's worth saying that out loud because I know when you've heard a lot of sermons as a Christian, um, it's easy to get into the mode where you're thinking of all the other people who should have heard that sermon. <laughs> yeah, you're sitting there and you're going, great point, Dixon. I wish Bob was here to hear that. <laughs> right? And no offence, leaders are the worst because we hear too many sermons and we're always just thinking of other people who need to hear it. And, and, and this just arrests my attention that this is for all of us. Wherever we are, God speaks to us all. All right. They're the tidbits. Uh, let's look properly at the, the thanksgiving itself. Um, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. The single thing Paul thanks God for when he, when he thinks of the Philippians is the way they have coin-owned. There you go, just, just one Greek word. There's a second later. Just, you can learn two Greek words today, okay? It's never hurt anyone either. Coin-owned, partner. Partner. In the gospel, the, the message of Jesus' life and teaching and death and resurrection. You are partners in the gospel. Now, he doesn't mean um, simply that you share in the same belief. That's not what he's thanking God for. There are other ways of saying that. He's saying, you're like business partners. That's what the coin-owned word typically means. You're, you're partners in the venture of promoting the gospel throughout the world. From the first day when I was with you in about the year 51, right through to now, when I'm locked up in prison about the year 62. You are partners in the gospel. Now, how do we know that that's what Paul means, the, the sort of business partnership between Paul and the Philippians? We know because of that passage I quoted earlier from the end of this same letter where the koinon word appears. It was good of you to koinon, partner, share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church coin-owned, partnered with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. And when you know that this partnership in the gospel refers to their practical commitment to the mission to get the gospel out to the world, it unlocks the rest of the thanksgiving. So let's go back to the thanksgiving and unpack it. I always pray with joy because of your koinonia estoyu on partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Look what he says. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The good work is not just the salvation that God has worked in the Philippians, but their good work of supporting the gospel. So what Paul describes as their partnership in verse 5, he now describes as God's work in them in verse 7. That's worth holding in mind. I know you've been well taught over the years about this, that even our best efforts are the work of God in us. It's a mystery. 
But Paul can describe your partnership in the gospel as God's good work in you. Uh, but then Thanksgiving goes on. He says, it's right for me to feel all this joy and love for you, about all of you, since I have you in my heart. Whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you, what? Coin own. I feel like we should have bingo cards here today, right? <laughs> Partner in God's grace with me. So we know we're still on track. It's still the partnership that Paul's thanking God for. And I don't mean to remove God from the Bible, Lord forgive me, but God isn't there in there, in that sentence. I don't know why the NIV stuck it there. It's just um, this grace. Now, the reason it's worth knowing uh, that what, what Paul says is all of you partner in this grace with me is that he's still talking about their partnership, God's good work in them, the grace of their financial support of the work of the gospel. And you might think, hang on, that seems weird. How can financial partnership be described as grace? I thought grace was just God's loving favor toward us because of Jesus Christ. Yes. But then Paul frequently says that when we've been touched by God's grace, the wonderful things we do in God's name are also grace. And here's a perfect example. This is just so you know I'm not making this up. Right? No, this is not secret Wheaton College New Testament stuff, right? It's plainly throughout Paul's letters. And here's just one good example. Uh, to the Corinthians, where he's talking about a big financial donation they are giving to the poor in 2 Corinthians 8, we read, Now, brothers, I want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of, bingo, coin own partnering in this service to the saints. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. We go back to the Philippians passage. Paul is thanking God for what he calls their partnership in the gospel, their financial support to the gospel mission. What he also calls God's work in you, and he also calls it the grace that is overflowing. I reckon there are amazing lessons here. Paul's fondest recollection of the Philippians is that touched by the love and mercy and grace of God, they have in exuberance contributed to the work of God in the world financially. And the lesson I take from this is that financially contributing to the work of the gospel is not a second string secular, necessary evil. It is actual partnership in the gospel. It is as if you are preaching the gospel. I first learned this viscerally years ago when, I know it's hard to believe now, I, I was a singer in a band. My first career was as a singer. But not just as a singer, I would speak in between songs and it became a full-time thing. We'd travel around Australia singing and speaking in prisons, um, schools and universities, pubs, bars, clubs. And on one occasion, we were way up north in Darwin, okay, uh, which is the very tip of Australia. And we'd done about four weeks of concerts and gospel preaching. And now, about three or four days later, we had to be in Melbourne which is down the bottom, which is 2,300 miles. Okay, so our truck didn't go very fast, so we were zooming down the highway, truck, bus, zipping down the Stewart Highway, about 100 kilometers, 60 miles, north of Cooper Pedy, a town worth Googling. <laughs> I mean, it's so hot out there, 
much of the town is underground, including churches and hotels and everything. Anyway, that's just for free this morning. About 100 <laughs> kilometres, 60 miles north of Cooper Pedy, the truck engine blew up. I mean, it was spectacular. And we thought, oh no, we have about six weeks of work down in Melbourne in just three more days. And churches had booked us months in advance to play in schools and clubs and town halls. We were going to sing and preach. And we rang our manager up in Sydney and we said, so sorry, we've blown the truck. We're going to have to cancel all those gigs until we, because we weren't super rich. And we all spent a night together in one hotel room, the whole band, the crew, and our wives. <laughs> My darling, Buff, has never let me forget this one night together. <laughs> anyway, the next morning, our manager rang us and said, guys, get going. Put the truck on the train down to Adelaide because someone has just written us a giant check to pay for it all. Cam. Cam wrote a check on the, on the spot, paying for the haulage fees, brand new engine, mechanic. Within three days, we were in Melbourne with all the gear, singing and preaching our heart out. And the reason I tell you this is because Cam, though a committed Christian, would be the last person to describe himself as an evangelist. A little bit of a shy guy. But I want to say what he did in contributing to the work was just as much an advancement of the gospel as what I was doing behind the microphone every evening. And that's what Paul is saying when he speaks of partnership in the gospel. And I don't think he just only refers to money because later in chapter one, he refers to prayers he says to the Philippians, I will continue to rejoice because I know that's through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Christ Jesus. And what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So prayers are another way. I would say inviting your friends who don't believe to church is also partnership in the gospel. Um, the, 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 the good life you live, the life of love to display the gospel is also partnership for the gospel. You might not feel like much of a proclaimer. And I want to say to you, Paul would give thanks for you if you're doing what you can do to advance the gospel, given whatever opportunities and resources you have. All right, that's what Paul thanks God for when he thinks of the Philippians. Let's turn now to what he prays for. Because immediately after he thanks God, he then says, um, I'm praying for you. Now, I reckon if you knew Paul and you like revered Paul, you'd take this very seriously, wouldn't you? Think of the person you respect most in life. The person who's like opinion or words, you think, wow, that's serious. It might be the person who led you to become a Christian. It, it might be a pastor a professor. For me, it's this man, Paul Bunhead, who in Australia is a well-known ancient historian, New Testament scholar, but also the bishop of the north of Sydney, um, where I grew up. And 25 years ago, he sort of took me under his wing and it mentored me ever since. And I'm saying to you, if I got a letter from him and, it, and he said, John, there's one thing I'm praying for you, he has my attention. I don't know who it is for you, but think how the Philippians must have felt when they got to verse nine. And this is my prayer. I've told you what my praise is, my thanksgiving. Here's my prayer for you. And they're going, okay, what is it? What are you praying? That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He doesn't pray that they'd be more active in the gospel mission. He's already confident about that. What does he pray? 
He prays that their love may abound more and more. It's even more intense in the Greek language. You've already learned one Greek word today, koinon. Yeah? Here's another Greek adverb, super simple, eti, eti. And it's missing from the translation. I don't know why the NIV left it out. Maybe because it sort of makes for bad reading English. But he actually says that your love may abound even more and more. I find that significant. Because Paul isn't saying you guys don't have any love. He's saying I want you to abound even more and more. The Philippians um, actually, we know, could do with a little more love. I mean, their love for God was awesome. Their love for Paul was great. Their love for the gospel message was fantastic. But we do know they could do with a little bit more love. And, and I'll point this out next week and the week after in particular. There was some grumbling going on in the church. And, and part of the letter is saying, you guys are awesomely committed to the gospel. That's fantastic. Um, it'd be great if you lived by the love of the gospel. I think that's, that's what's going on. Love. Notice that Paul, though, quickly qualifies what he means by love. He adds the words that may sound weird to us because love for us has become sort of a fluffy, ethereal thing. But Paul says that your love may abound even more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may discern what is best. Now, that, we don't normally think that love is connected with knowledge and insight and discernment. We kind of separate the affective from the intellectual. Not Christian love. Christian love is grounded in the knowledge of God, insight into his character, discernment about what God thinks is best. And when you think about it, love has to be that. Love isn't warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is willing the good of the other. And therefore, you have to know what the good is to will the good for the other. Sometimes the world wishes the church would just be all accepting, all embracing, warm and fuzzy. But in a family, we'd call that neglect. Wouldn't we? If a, if a dear family member was going off the rails and we just went, oh, yay for you. <laughs> Love wills the good for the beloved. Therefore, there is an intimate connection between love and knowledge. And, and Paul says Christian love is rooted in the knowledge of God, insight into his character and discernment of what is best. It's willing the good of the other. Paul is praying, if I can put it like this, that the Philippians would be marked by conviction and compassion. Do you like this? The Christian life simultaneously flexes the muscle of conviction and compassion. Jesus was, of course, the master of this, wasn't he? He had convictions. He talked about what was right and wrong rather a lot. But did he love people? Oh, yeah. Now, I'm ashamed to say that in the history of the church, the church has sometimes been all conviction and not much compassion. You know, all about the truth and the good and theology and not much compassion. Ever seen that? Is that just an Australian thing? And sometimes the church has been the opposite. All love and, oh, bless you. With no conviction, no knowledge of the good, no willing the, the best. But Paul is pleading for love rooted in knowledge, conviction and compassion, beautifully together. And different people forget different things because our personalities lean one way or the other. There are some super loving, all embracing people who are sort of, that's their personality and, and they need to think about knowledge and depth of insight and willing the good of the other. And there are others who are more sort of straight down the line, you know, the truth, intellect. And we need to remember 
about love. Let me tell you when this thought hit home to me in, the, in a ministry context, for the first time really, I got a letter from my brother. He was rather a lot older than when this photo was taken of my cute little brother, a little blondie there. But I was in ministry, full time, singing and preaching around the world, having a great time, saving the world. 10 months of the year on the road, two months a year back home in Sydney. My brother had just become a Christian and he worked out that I was off saving the world but I'd forgotten about my friends and family back home. I was so caught up in my little serving God that I wasn't caring for people I knew who were in need back home. And he wrote me a letter, like an actual letter, you know, like with pen on paper. And the letter arrived in my mailbox. Is that what you call it, mailbox? Or is it called something else? Oh, okay, there you go. And it said, to the fabulously famous John Dixon, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> I opened it. I read this two, three page letter where Jamie detailed the way Jesus had said, we've got to love one another. It's not just about loving God and saving the world. It's about caring for people. And he listed some examples from scripture and examples in, in my life where I had neglected people back home. And then the kicker was, at the end of the letter, he said, you know what? Just the other day, mum, our, our mum wasn't a believer, mum said to me, Jamie, you are a much better advertisement for Christianity than your hyper-Christian brother. Now, I wish I could say, and from that day, I have been love embodied. <laughs> no, but it was like a mirror to my personality. It was the moment where I realized that is my tendency to be all activity and goals and not so much love and care. I should have been both. Conviction and compassion. Friends, whatever pressures we're feeling at the moment, as a church, as an individual, this passage of Paul is designed to refocus our attention, to get us back on target, to the two great callings of the Christian life. The thing he thanks God most for, partnership in the gospel. And the thing he prays most for, that our love would abound even more and more. This is God's word to us all today. So we pray, Father, that you would speak to us by your spirit. Draw us to the gospel of Jesus. That we as a church would refocus on our mission to bring the gospel to our community, to the world. But never forgetting to abound in love for one another, even more and more. For we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of one another. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always.